So the really inconvenient truth, which we do not wish to discuss, and certainly is not on any uh, political platform to date, are these ones. This is actually a statement from the World Business Council on Sustainable Development, or at least the output of a workshop they held in the early 90s in Antwerp, Belgium, looking at the uh, data on uh, material resource trends, um, pollution around the earth, matching this against productive and carrying capacity. That workshop concluded that in the industrial world, reductions of up to 90% would be required by the middle of this century in order to enable necessary growth to occur in the third world and to keep the whole within the carrying capacity of the planet. So this is now a, a version of what we call contraction and convergence. We in the rich countries have got to slow down, in fact reduce our consumption to create the ecological space necessary for the deservedly, uh, those who deserve to grow uh, so that they can come up to a decent standard. Keep in mind there's now officially a billion people on earth who are malnourished, another two billion who don't get sufficient, that's calorically malnourished, and probably another two billion who are deficient in some dietary standard or other. So we don't notice because we've always had plenty in this resource rich part of the planet, uh, but the fact is that half the people on earth are still living the Malthusian dilemma. We should be designing a smaller uh, equitable steady state economy that maintains itself within carrying capacity. Not, this is not difficult. Is it? The concepts are easy. The getting there is the difficult part because of the conflictual nature of the human animal. Now many people are horrified at the thought that we would have to shrink. But there's plenty of evidence to show that this shouldn't be a, a problem if we really were an intelligent species. Here is a graph from a book called The Loss of Happiness in Market Democracies by Robert T. Lane. What Lane documents here is the lack of any correlation, any uh, continuous correlation between felt well-being, be between people's sense of happiness, uh, security in the future and all of that, and rising incomes. So th this happens to be data from the United States. So from 1940 to 1990, there was an increase in U.S. per capita GDP in adjusted dollar terms from six to $20,000 per capita. But during that whole time, the numbers of people reporting themselves to be happy or very happy was in steady decline. So that we see no connection between rising incomes and happiness through that entire period. In fact, if you were acting logically and happiness was your goal, remember in the US Constitution it's the pursuit of happiness that you're supposed to be after, then you'd want to get back here to $6,000 per year as soon as possible to increase the happiness quotient. If we look, that was an object, or, uh, a subjective indicator. If you plot objective indicators of well-being, we see much the same thing. So this is a plot of longevity versus income in the world's countries. Now economists are quite correct that rising incomes uh, produce benefits, but only up to a point. And so what we see here is that countries with almost no income or very impoverished countries, these are the ones with those eco footprints of less than a hectare or so, have very low life expectancy. But as they get richer, this curve rises, but it doesn't rise indefinitely. It flattens out at about 10,000 international uh, dollars per year, purchasing power parity adjusted. After that, there's no response. So that countries that are way out here, at $60,000 per year, I think that's Luxembourg, aren't doing any better than a country down here at $10,000 or $12,000 a year. So again, no correlation between indicators of population health and income beyond a certain point. The United States per cap or ex life expectancy is now in decline, even as incomes rise, as the quality of the average health of the population declines with uh, excess consumption and so on and so forth. So again, what this curve says is we should be, since it is the case, that economic growth is doing two things. It's destroying the biological basis of our existence and People out here aren't benefiting from that growth. We saw that in the last slide. So it should be redirected to the people over here who can benefit from it. Okay. So it's a redirect contraction and convergence again. 
Moreover, we might say, what's the optimal scale of the economy? It's an economy that produces 10, 12,000 purchasing power parity adjusted dollars per annum. Once you've reached that point, you don't need further growth. You should work half a week and go home and play with your kids for the other half. Or go sailing or cycling or take a walk. Meet your wife once in a while, or husband as the case may be. So there's lots of room here greatly to improve the quality of your life even as your income drops without for a moment changing your longevity, life, uh, we've done this with infant mortality rates, a post-operative survival, a whole array of indicators remain very high uh, even if we lose three quarters of our income. So when we talk about reducing our footprints by 80%, that would mean coming from here down to here with no change in the quality, the objective quality of our existence. That's not such a bad deal if in the meantime you help out a bunch of impoverished people. Remember, we're compassionate, right? And we stop destroying the planet. Hey, that's a good idea. So, question, what would an intelligent species do? <laughs> it would start talking about the optimal scale of the economy. What is the appropriate level of consumption to maximize health? to maximize the capacity of people to self-actualize, to use a yuppie phrase of a few years ago. Well, we don't ask those questions because we're all caught up in this incredible scramble to hang on to the jobs we've got and compete other people out of the planet and uh, keep working ourselves into the grave. So the good news is we actually could and we have the technology to enable that 75 to 80 percent reduction while actually improving the quality of our life. The bad news is we don't act. Privileged elites who have the greatest stake in the status quo, those who will defend their political positions because they're operating from the reptilian brainstem, the wealthy who use the wealth as a... See, social status is far more important than the absolute quantity of wealth, but we'll defend that status to the last, okay? So that we don't act because the people in power have the most, they think, to lose by so acting. And they're the ones who can uh, literally control the levers of power. The rest of us have been conned into participation in this insane suicidal path. Right? We are the most socially engineered generation on the face of the earth. And every year hundreds of million, no billions of dollars are spent to entrain you in the consumer cycle of unhappiness. What is advertising designed to do? <laughs> to make you feel miserable <laughs> about the car you bought last year, about the computer you have now that doesn't have like Vista, you're lucky, about what are, you see what I'm getting at. We, we plan <laughs> to make ourselves unhappy. I think the advertising industry probably hires more psychologists who are figuring out all the time how to make you ashamed of your house, your car, your wife, your kids and whatever else so you can buy your way into the happiness that you might have. So we've bought into it, lock, stock and barrel. Unfortunately we're not even aware of this. You see, it's, it's programmable. We're programmable and we're not even aware of it. That's the irony of it all.